the meantime, he'll he'll stop chewing the pillow there because he's really enjoying pillow chewing. Folks, if you're listening, our 18 month old puppy is uh, here in the room with us and he's chewing a pillow. He's not supposed to be chewing. So we'll have to straighten that out. He might have to go, he might have to go to lockdown. <laughs> oh, I understand we're live now. Okay, great. Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Night Skies at Home, the Franklin Institute's regular monthly night astronomy program. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum, your cool astronomer, with the August 2021 edition of Night Skies at Home. Night Skies at Home is our regular monthly astronomy program that we've put into place since we are not opening the observatory at night to the public right now due to the pandemic. And so we wanted to make sure we're keeping you up to date on the night skies and all things related to the night skies so that you can take some time to go outside, look up and enjoy the night sky. But we want you to understand what you're seeing. And we also wanna be able to help you fit it into the context of your lives. So while we may talk about some deep subjects and some complex topics, the idea here is to make you familiar enough and comfortable enough so that when you go outside at night, you'll be able to tell exactly what you're seeing, which way you're looking and what's up there for you to see so that you can share that with others. We're hoping that you'll enjoy the experience enough that you'll wanna do it over and over and over again and you begin to build up some competency in observing the night sky. Now, often people think that doing this takes a long time or it's complicated. There's a lot of mathematics involved, a lot of physics involved, and yes, indeed, all of that is true. But we're all about the simple part here. We're all about making this easy enough for anybody to digest, no matter whether you're six years old, 66 years old, or 96 years old, there's something in this for you to observe when you go outside to take a look at the night sky. And that ranges everywhere from planets and moons and stars and nebulae and galaxies to spacecraft as well. All of those things are within your capability of sight, even though you might live in a center city environment, in an urban environment, there's still plenty for you to see, plenty for you to understand, uh, plenty for you to put together to understand how the sky works over our heads, so that you feel familiar and comfortable with the sky, no matter where you're observing from. All of this information applies to what you might see no matter where you're observing from. And so that's one thing I'll ask of you tonight. If you're joining us tonight, tell us where you're joining us from. Let us know if you're observing from California or Canada or from Florida or from someplace else around the world. We'd love to have you aboard. So please let us know where you're observing from. So again, this program is the August 2021st edition of Night Skies at the Observatory, the Franklin Institute's monthly astronomy program, and I'm Derek Pitts, your host this evening. I'm the Chief Astronomer and Planetarium Programs Director at the Franklin Institute. I'm your cool astronomer. And in fact, that happens to be my Twitter handle, at cool astronomer. So if you have questions or comments, you know, you can always reach me there. But for tonight, please send us your questions. I want to know what you're interested in. So send me your questions. And the way you send them is just use the chat function here or the comments function here on Facebook, right here on Facebook. And that way your questions will get to me. My technical director, my technical producer, Katie, is in the studio in the back there. She's taking care of the technical side of things over there. She'll see your questions. She'll forward them on to my studio producer, the lovely Linda sitting right over here. Say hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. She's also taking care of the 18 month old puppy Jet. He's sitting over there too. But in the meantime, if you send your questions, put them there in the comments section. Katie will get them. She'll feed them over to Linda. Linda will let me know what they are and we'll ask them right on the air so that uh, we can find out what it is you're interested in. We have a lot of great stuff coming up for you this evening and we've been just taking some time to help other people get on board with us this evening as we get started. But here's what we're gonna do tonight. You know, as I said, this is all about becoming a regular sky watcher. So it turns out that this is a perfect month for casual sky gazers to learn the lay of the land. Well, the lay of the sky really. Learn how things are laid out in the sky and understand the flow of what we see in the sky during the course of the year. We can actually get a feel for that if we sort of observe on a regular basis 
for a month or so, nothing really heavy, you'll be able to get the flow of how things go throughout the course of the year. What's most interesting about that is when we're looking at the sky and we see changes from month to month, while we might think it's the sky that's moving by overhead, in actuality, it is the earth that's moving underneath the sky. There's that daytime motion where we see the sun moving across the sky or the moon moving across the sky. And then there's what we call annual motion where the constellations slowly change from month to month. If you're watching that over time, you're actually watching how the earth is orbiting the sun. Way too cool to actually watch the celestial mechanics at work and you can see it. Oh, did I mention? No telescope or binoculars are needed for this. You don't have to have a degree in mathematics or astronomy to do this either. It's really very simple. It's you, your eyes, the sky, sit back, be comfortable, be cool, relaxed, and watch what's happening overhead. So what else do we have for you? Well, we're going to take a look at the bright constellations that are available for the summer sky. We're going to talk about the planets that are available for, for this time of this year. We'll also talk about a meteor shower a very prominent meteor shower. In fact, the most prominent, well, second most prominent meteor shower now, actually, as it turns out, uh, in the year, for the entire year, happens this month. In fact, it already started. But don't jump up and run out to go see it because there's a special time when you should go look. We'll talk about that and why it turns out to be that way. We're also going to have a chance to talk to a really, really cool person that's going to join us all the way from Chile. Fabiola Cruzat is an engineer who works on the uh, ALMA uh, uh, antenna array at the ALMA radio telescope site on the Chajnantor pl uh, Plateau uh, in the high desert regions in Chile. It's a mouthful to get that all out. But what we're talking about is we're talking about a radio telescope array of 66 radio dishes. And she is the engineer that maintains those radio dishes. And you know what? I got to tell you, this is an amazing job because these are amazing dishes. This is no slouch for a telescope. The way I say this is that this is big science, way up there where the air is rare. 16,000 feet altitude is where this array is located. And she works on these radio telescopes to make sure that this array keeps operating. So we're going to learn about what she does. She's going to join us. We'll talk about how she got into this, all sorts of cool things like that. And as you're listening, Send us your questions about that too. You know, it's really rare that we get an, op an opportunity to talk to an engineer who actually works on radio telescopes. In this case, a radio telescope array. Hey, wait a minute. A radio telescope array at almost at the top of the world, 16,000 feet up in the uh, desert, high desert of Chile. And just a moment, one last thing. It's the biggest radio telescope array anywhere in the world. So a woman. you're right in on the thing. And as Linda says, it's a woman who's doing this work. So ladies, if you're listening, this works for you, okay? So check it out and join us with your questions, okay? Let's see, what else are we doing? Uh, gee, that's about enough for right now. So I'll tell you what, hey, let's get started here. Uh, let me remind you that we're looking for your questions about astronomy, anything you hear us talking about here or anything that comes to mind, send us your questions through the comments. We'll be happy to try to answer them in case we don't get to all of the questions tonight during the program. I'm monitoring those questions and tomorrow I'll jump on them and I'll send you a response. So please send us your questions. We'd love to have them. Okay, great. So let's go over our basic sky phenomenon just to get rolling here with that part. So we'll see where we are for the year and then we'll jump into our uh, program this evening and we'll get started with that part. So uh, you may realize, you may have seen it already, but things are beginning to change. We had the summer solstice back in June we're now halfway between the first day of summer and the first day of fall. That came around August 1st. That's a cross quarter day. That's the halfway point between the seasonal start dates, a cross quarter day. Um, farmers from some time ago, from centuries ago, used to keep much closer track on the progression of time according to the calendar and cross quarter days splitting a season in half gave them a way to keep closer track on when they were planting crops, when they were harvesting crops. And that, of course, made it possible for them to create the foodstuffs they needed to survive through the course of the winter, the worst part of the year. So cross-quarter days are really important. We just passed the, that cross-quarter day. But you know what that means for us? 
it means that things are changing in the sky in terms of sunrise and sunset. Sunrise is now coming at 6.04 a.m., 6.04 a.m. Remember back in June, it was at five o'clock, 5.30 in the morning. Now it's at 6.04, so we've lost a whole half hour right there. But wait, check this out, sunsets. Last month, sunset was at, at 8.33 p.m. Right now, sunset is at 8.09 p.m. So we've almost lost a half hour there. That means we've lost a whole hour of daylight on the day so far. And we're not even through the summer yet. So if you pay close attention, you'll see that things are beginning to change in terms of our illumination, all related to the Earth's motion around the sun and the axial tilt of the Earth, which we've talked about before, and maybe we'll mention a little bit more of. But you know what this reminds me of? There's still plenty of time to enjoy summer, but don't take too much time to do that because we're gonna lose those wonderful minutes of evening time when the sky is so beautiful after sunset and we have these long deep sunsets. You know, it reminds me of my uh, liberal arts education portion of my uh, degree uh, in which I studied uh, English literature. Robert Herrick was a poet of the 17th century and he had this really, really wonderful poem called to the virgins to make much of time. Robert Herrick, to the virgins to make much of time. It's what you might call a, a carpe diem poem. Carpe diem from the Latin meaning seize the day. And this poem is all about taking advantage of summer in an interesting way to seize these beautiful days and make something of them. So look it up, Robert Herrick, to the virgins, to make much of time. I really like it. I think you'll like it too. Okay, so where are we with the moon? Well, right now it's at a waning crescent. Uh, new moon is coming up on Sunday, just a couple of days from now. So right now the moon is at a very thin crescent. It rises at 345 in the morning. So the best time for you to see it is in the morning, way after sunrise, say about seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning over on the western side of the sky. Oh, Actually, the moon is sliding closer and closer to the sun right now. So uh, if you're up in the morning before sunrise or right around sunrise, you'll find a beautiful crescent moon over toward the eastern horizon. It'll be a really, really nice sight for you to see. And that's the best time to see this waning crescent. It's because of the fact that we're so close to uh, the new moon that, we, that the moon is now visible at that time of the morning over on the east and southeastern portion of the sky at sunrise. Uh, it rises, as I said, at 3.45 a.m., that's for tomorrow, and it sets at 7.21 p.m. And as I mentioned, there's all sorts of really great stuff to see in the sky, and we'll talk in more detail about the planets and the constellations coming up in just a couple of minutes. Uh, a little bit later in the program, we'll talk about those really great constellations, and we'll talk about orientation and things like that. But I understand we have a couple of questions, so let's do a couple of questions right now. And then our special guest is joining us from Chile. She's here already in our studio. And so we're gonna do a couple of questions right now and then we'll have a great time to chat with Fabiola. So uh, let's do some questions. What do you have, Linda? First off, we have shout outs from San Juan, Puerto Rico, Cape Cod, Virginia. Wow, we have shout outs from San Juan, Puerto Rico, from Cape Cod, from Virginia. Any places? Florida. New York, Florida, New Jersey, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Great. Fabulous. Glad to have you aboard. Those folks in San Juan, we're so glad you could be with us this evening. What we talk about in terms of what's available in the sky is also working for you too. So don't worry about that. You'll be able to see the same things and maybe a couple of other things because you're a little bit further south, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay. All right. Great. What's Mike, next? Mike would like to know if you would explain the moon wobble. Oh, Mike wants to know if I would explain moon wobble. Yeah, you know, the moon has a couple of interesting motions. And, um, you know, when you actually start studying the moon's motion, you find out that it's more than just its orbit around the Earth. One of the main wobbles that it has is the stuff called uh, libration, where the moon sort of rocks back and forth. It seems to rock back and forth as it orbits the Earth. And this alters how much of the surface of the moon we can see at various times in its phasing. And there's some discussion right now that perhaps this wobble that's happening with the moon is, is, is going to accentuate in a way that it's going to affect uh, what weather conditions are like here on the Earth at some time in the not too, too distant future. It's really interesting to consider the effect that the moon has on Earth. And uh, honest to goodness, I really have to read a little bit more about it myself. 
But the most interesting thing about it is that the moon does have all these motions that we typically don't consider when we're just observing the moon. But when you really get into studying the moon very carefully and it's rising and setting times and it's apogees and it's perigees, a lot of these will begin to show themselves. So uh, this wobble that Mike is asking about is a normal feature of the moon. It's been going on as long as the moon has been in existence. And uh, the, the issue about it and its effect on it on the environment is, is this motion that we see, this wobble that we talk about, this, this cyclic motion actually, how much of an effect does that cyclic motion have on the Earth's environment and the Earth's weather system? So I have to admit, I'm going to do a little bit more studying on that myself, uh, but thanks for the question. I really do appreciate it. And you know what, Mike, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me dig in on that and I'll come back with more complete information on our next time around. There's so much stuff out there to keep track of. Who can keep track of it all? I don't know. But uh, thanks for that. We'll come back to it. What's next? Sue would like you to talk a little about Messier 2000, the black hole. Wow. Sue. Sue is asking about Messier 2000. It's a black hole. I'm going to assume that Messier 2000, the black hole, must be like a super gigantic black hole. Can you tell me more about that, Sue? Uh, the reason, here's the reason why I asked, uh, and maybe the spelling's not right or something like that, because when we talk about Messier objects, Messier objects are fuzzy objects seen in the night sky. They were identified first by 18th century astronomer Charles Messier as he was hunting for comets. And he made a great list of these objects called Messier objects so that he would be able to tell the difference between comets and these other things. Some he didn't know what they were. He didn't know if they were galaxies or nebulae. He just knew they weren't comets. But that list only goes to, I think at last count, 110. So when you say Messier 2000, uh, you know, either I'm way out of touch or there have been a lot of discoveries of Messier objects in like the last year, somewhere between 110 and 2000. I'm not too sure. So if you can give me just a touch more information about that, Sue, I'd be glad to try to jump on that. What's next, Linda? That's it for now. Okay, that's it for now. Folks, please send us your questions. Be happy to try and answer them for you. Uh, so uh, greatly appreciate you being here. If you have other questions, let's have those questions. Okay, great. So now, folks, here we go. I am really, really happy to be able to talk to you about a really, really cool uh, piece of equipment that I should say a really, really fantastic observatory that is uh, in use in Chile that is a radio observatory. You know, we often talk about uh, uh, visual astronomy on this program because that's what people are closest to. Uh, we may not have such an opportunity to talk about radio astronomy because not many of us really do radio astronomy. That seems to be much more in the field for professional astronomers to do serious radio astronomy because the equipment is different. It's much more sophisticated. It looks at different uh, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum other than the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's a, it's a little bit more challenging to do. But radio astronomy is really a very important piece of the work that astronomers do to understand the full picture of how the universe works. You know, we have information that comes to us in almost every form of radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves, which are really the longest kind of electromagnetic rays, all the way up to gamma rays, which are the most intense. And so when we look across the universe, we need to look at each and every one of these radiation bands so that we can glean information that comes to us from objects in space. They create information or they, their energies reveal to us who they are and what they do through these different radiations. And radio astronomy has been the most important piece of understanding the sky because you can do work in radio that you cannot do in visible light. And so if you wanted to understand a complete story about anything, you need not just the visible, but you need the radio too. But radio is really, really challenging. Well, there are tremendous facilities around the world that do radio work. And one of the finest of these in the world, absolutely, is the Atacama uh, millimeter, submillimeter radio telescope array that's located in the Atacama Desert in Chile. This is an incredible complex that sits at a very high altitude, 16,000 feet up, where it has eliminated most of the atmosphere that cuts off 
radio waves coming from space. And in this way, astronomers can do extraordinary work using this amazing number of dishes all pulled together into a system that works together to give very, very high resolution for objects in space, creating energy in the radio spectrum. But in order for such incredible technology to work, you need the best people in the world to make it work. And tonight, I am so pleased to have as our guest this evening, Fabiola Cruzat, who is uh, the, antenna, the Antenna Array uh, Radio Telescope Engineer at the Alma Observatory down there in Chile. So I'm gonna ask uh, Fabiola if she'll join us now. And that way we can uh, chat with her. Hi there, Rick. Hey, Fabiola, hi. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good. Nice to see you there. Uh, and it's so funny to hear you all this talking about summertime. Here is, uh, is uh, wintertime in South America. We are oh on the goodness. other side of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much all for your... reminding us about that. <laughs> yes. So your explanation is different for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fabiola, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, uh, I'm so glad to have you here so that we can help our audience understand uh, a, a bit about the Alma Observatory. But you know, really more importantly, we'd like our audience to understand your interest in engineering in, in this particular realm of not just astronomy, but in radio astronomy and how you come to this work. So um, if you would, please, would you just describe for our okay. audience what your job is? Okay, my, my job is I'm a mechanical engineer. So I am in charge of the maintenance of the telescope. We have four types of, of telescope here in Chile and as any machine they need to do preventive maintenance and corrective maintenance. So we have a plan for the preventive maintenance and the corrective maintenance is not so often, but also we have to do so. I got to change a screw, change the oil, or repair a, an electronic car, you know, whatever can be done. And it's in the desert, so we have to be prepared because it's nothing there. So we have to have everything, the spare tool, the team, to do whatever happen and, and do it. <laughs> So Fabiola, uh, if I can, I'm going to share my screen just so that I can show a picture of what the observatory looks like. Um, and if you would, please, uh, would you mind if I think you'll be able to see my picture, too, if you wouldn't mind just describing what I'm showing. It'll take me just a moment to get there. Here we are. And I'm just going to blow this up so everybody can see this. Yeah, there you can see the desert in the, in the north of Chile, the Atacama Desert, where uh, some of our antennas, because we do have 66, uh, we call them antennas, but this white stuff that you see there are the telescope. <laughs> we call them antennas, but they are telescope, radio astronomy telescope. And we do have four types of this telescope. 25 of them are American manufacturers, another 25 were uh, European delivery, and the other um, 12, 16, the other 16 are Japanese. This is uh, uh, the Alma Observatory, is a joint venture around, I don't know how many countries, like 30. <laughs> wow, 30 countries, that's amazing. Around, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if you see the, the, the yellow machine, big machine there, that is a transport. Yes. Okay, that is a transporter. Unfortunately, I talk in the metric system. So um, I will tell you this is, the, each antenna is around 100 ton. That will be in your weight, uh, 200. Wow. Yeah. And 100, this, 100 tons for ton. each one of those dishes? Yes, and we move them around as little, little chickens. <laughs> 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 we just... Well, uh, uh, as the astronomers, you know, they, they, they wish a configuration and we have to move our, our, among eight, six or 10 every, every month to do the diabeters that they want. So the astronomer can observe. We simulate a big telescope by moving them. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me see if I understand this correctly. 
So, e, so first of all, we're saying that there are 66 of these radio telescope dishes and yes. you think of them working all together as a single telescope. Exactly. And, and, and the dishes themselves not only weigh a hundred tons each, but they're movable? Yes, exactly. We, we, this is called interferometry. So with a big computer, we make an image. We can use one of them, two of them, or the 66 of them all together at the same time. And that's why we are the biggest telescope of observatory in the world, because we, we, by moving them, we can make a diameter simulating a telescope of 16 kilometer, uh, 16 kilometer diameter. I don't know kilometers in. Wow, no, 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 that's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's, what, that's why we move them. We move them to, to, to like zoom in or zoom out. When you do your camera, a diameter. Oh yeah. So that, that's what we do. We play with them and, and according as what the astronomer want to observe. I'm not sure play with them exact is exactly the right term for an <laughs> instrument. That's a hundred times. That's incredible. Now I think I might have a picture of of the mover. I'm mm. going to see if I have a picture of the mover. Uh, yeah, we, we have two of them, two movers, two transporter. We call them Otto and Lori. Oh. They have names. <laughs> Ot Otto and Otto. And Lori. Lori is the wife and Otto is the husband. <laughs> ah, that's cute. That's cute. That's cute. Okay, I'm going to see if I can find the picture because I want people to see what they look like. But um, yeah. Fabiola, t tell us, if you would, please. So, so you can move these dishes around. Um, are, are these when you when you move them around, you're moving them around from one place to from one location to another location, and are these locations set up to accept the telescope so that you can you like you said you can connect them all together so that you can yeah, exactly. collect the information it, that comes from each one? Exactly, and that that is the marvelous of this observatory because they are a hundred ten tons machine. But we move them around to there. You see a concrete that you just ah there you have the transporter, that is uh, Lodi, and and we move them and we place them over. We call it path. It's a parking lot, and this parking lot is prepared with fiber optic, with power, and the the precision of the three points of suspension of this telescope cannot be more than three millimeters between them. So. This is an enormous telescope that we move. It takes us around two, three hours to move them depending on the distance. It could be less or more. And then we have to place them back in a special designated parking lot. And this parking lot is prepared for this telescope by a very accurate three surface, the ridges that uh, support them and with the fiber optic for the communication, the power from the communication. So of course, before lifting them up, we have to disconnect them. You know, if not, we are we can become very famous. <laughs> 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 the cables. <laughs> so we disconnect right. them. We disconnect them, and then we move them, and we keep them alive in this machine. This transporter have a generator, so we we keep. When I mean we keep them alive, is because uh, inside we have an electronic. And the electronic of this uh, observer of this is have the, the receiver band. And this receiver band work at temperature of four Kelvin. Is, whoa, uh, whoa, whoa, hold it, so four Kelvin. We, yes, so we want to keep them cold and alive. So when we connect them again, we don't waste time uh, adjusting everything. We install, we move an antenna in, in a day and then we can use it immediately. So, so the electronics, so the electronics work best when the temperature is really, really, really low. They, they need to be really, really low because if they were not really, really low, the, 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 the receiver are designed to be microconductores. So we, they have to work on this, this temperature to, to receive the wave because for us, the, the temperature is noise from the universe. So when we receive this band, have to be the, the receiver have to be really, really cold to, oh. 
interfere with this wave. Okay, okay. So, so this is so you keep them cold so that the so that the antenna can detect the object that it's pointed towards so that the electronics can detect the object that it's pointed toward without seeing anything else that might be in the night sky. Exactly, exactly. We have to keep the receiver have to be cold. Yes, cryogenic cold. The cryogenic cold. cold. Yeah. Yes. For, well, th this is for, this is incredibly. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. We have to be below four Kelvin for our receivers. So those are the temperatures we work for. I don't know if, if our, our uh, people know that the universe, the, the temperature of the universe is around 2.3 Kelvins and our receiver work around three Kelvin, three, between three and four Kelvins, our receivers. I, 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 that's, I don't know how you make anything that cold. I don't, I don't know how you make <laughs> anything that cold. That's incredible. That's really incredible. And it's so, it's so precise. And you know, when you think about, yeah. I mean, typically when people think about very, very big equipment like this, they may not be thinking about such incredible precision like the uh, object and like it has to be placed, you know, within three millimeters, millimeters of an exact yeah, location. Precision, yes. That, that is what is amazing about this. I call them ballerinas because when they move all together, they are really precise ballerina and, mm -hmm. and everything. They call them antennas. I like to call them telescope because they are delicate machines. I mean, they're very robust. And actually, the American antennas are very, very good. Yeah. But uh, they are telescope. And we have to treat them like, like that, you know. And, and they work in the desert in, at nighttime, very cold temperatures. During daytime, mm. more, more high temperatures. So you have to consider the structural deformation they suffer also, the mm -hmm. deep. And all these factors are being calibrated by, by software, by computers. So there are a lot of details that have been taken care of to have finally the, the signal that we, we, we need to for the observation. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, uh, now, tell us a little bit about the environment that these telescopes work in Fabiola. What's the environment like there uh, out on the desert where these are mounted? It is really, really dry because we are at uh, 5,200 uh, um, meters of, uh, that is like 15, 16 feet of, feet of uh, 16,000 feet, yeah. Uh -huh. feet, yes, of altitude. And it's very, very dry, 4% uh, sometimes of humidity. So wow. we are really, really high because, so that way the atm atmosphere doesn't, that doesn't interfere with the wave that we are receiving. When we are receiving a wave and you have a cloud in the middle, this mm -hmm. cloud will, will uh, interrupt our signal. So we are high, we have very dry desert mm -hmm. and the temperatures, I will say for United States, they're not so extreme because in your country you have extreme temperatures. Nighttime is minus 15, Daytime is plus five Celsius. Celsius. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So All right. But I understand. Uh, I understand it. It hardly ever rains at this altitude. No, it never rains. I mean, we have we have a snow. We have a snow during nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. Snow. Yeah, we have snow okay. so, from time to time. This and, time and this is snow. Yeah. And, and so is it, is, it, is it difficult, is it challenging uh, for people to work in an environment like this? Uh, yes, because it's really cold. We have to, the, as you see, the telescope are open. It's not a below a, a cupola uh, like the, the, the other observatories. And we have to use oxygen because uh, when we don't use oxygen, our head go banana. <laughs> 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 wow. We get, we get a little dummy. So we have to wear winter clothes, a bottle mm -hmm. of oxygen, and then the tools, the radio, and all the, the helmet, all the safety. So we are a little bit like astronauts, I will say, working there. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really interesting. I, I, I think one of the things I learned is that um, the part of the reason why you have uh, these these enormous trucks is so that if you have to do work on the on on a telescope, if there's some repair work that's needed on a telescope, often 
you'll pick it up and you'll bring it down from that very high altitude to a lower altitude where you can where you can work on it for a much longer period of time. Yeah, exactly. The, when we want to do an overhaul on an antenna, that is every 10 years, on when we need to do a major corrective maintenance, as you say, we bring them down to the base camp that is at 3,000 meters. And mm -hmm. that we were transported. And that took us like around five hours when we go down with mm -hmm. an antenna. Wow. Long trip with a big <laughs> antenna and a very big truck. That's amazing. OK, so now. Fabiola, tell us, how is it that you're into this work here? You're a mechanical engineer, which is, um, you know, fabulous. But how, do you, how did you come to be a mechanical engineer in a project like this? I mean, there are so many other kinds of projects that you could have been part of as a mechanical engineer. How is it that you came to this one? I, I don't know. I was just lucky, I would say. You know, in life, you sometimes you need... Uh... Of course, you have to, to, to work, you have to study, but like, like, good luck also help. <laughs> so <laughs> of course. There was, uh, I was, uh, yeah, as you say, I studied mechanical engineer. I used to work for an airline before maintenance. And oh. then I, I worked for a company in a structure. And then I saw this uh, in the newspapers and the advertisement. And I apply and, and I got the job. It will be 14, 14 years now that I'm in Alma. Wow. So I started kind of with Alma. <laughs> yeah. But this is this is interesting. You must you must uh, tell us how you feel having this kind of unique position, working with such an incredible instrument, and also how it is for you as a woman working in an environment like this with such such a unique piece of equipment. Well, you know, during the day to day, you get used, you don't realize, but when, when you talk to other people, then you realize, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a, a very special job. I mean, we are observing the universe, it's science, that is, that makes me feel very, very proud. And uh, also, I, I was the, the only woman when we started after we, we I, I, myself, I hired some other, other technicians or other women in the team. But um, I don't know. I feel really proud, and it's really, it's really interesting. And this project, as I told you before, we have people from all over the the world, from Europe, Japan, United States. So also uh, speaking English because in Chile we speak Spanish, but uh, speaking another language also help a lot. So for our people, you have to study not only the, the, <laughs> the career itself, but also language. And uh, having a family to help me back, to back up uh, a backup family, because I have two daughters. And there were 10 and 12 when I started there. And they, be, they are not professional. They are, are at university. And, and, but they were also helping me, you know. They were not crying when I was leaving. And they have mm. to, to cook themselves. I have to create a team around me also that we go we all go in the same direction to make it work. It, 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 I think it's really amazing. I think it's fantastic and great that you that you have this really fabulous position. You know, as a as a you know, in thinking about mechanical engineering, what was it about mm -hmm. mechanical engineering that attracted you to begin with? I mean, when you were younger. Did you imagine yourself as becoming a mechanical engineer? Did you, were you, did you already have this kind of interest in mechanics? Mm, not really, because uh, when you are, I mean, I, I always liked the, the, to, to play with cars and to, play, to, but when here, mostly in Chile, in Latin America, being a girl, you have to use a dress and you have to play with dolls. And I was always kind of rebelled, you know. My grand, mm. my, my father bought a motorcycle from my brother, not from me. But I was mm. the one with the motorcycle. I was the one who disassembled the motorcycle. Later on, we have a jeep for all the sister and brother, and I was the one driving the jeep. So <laughs> naturally, you know. And then I went for engineering, and then yeah, when I was in engineering, I, I went okay, mechanic. 
and I, I love it. It, it. it allows you to do so many things by being a mechanic and a, a mechanical engineer, you know, for the daily life, for the work, it's a very wonderful career. Would you, when you were an engineering student, were, I would imagine that there were very few women in the program. Yeah, I was the, the third one on coming out of that career here in Chile. I mean, yeah, we went 800 the first year. We end 40, 30, something the age year, and I was the, the only one. But I think it is just because people think that women cannot do it. It, it never was, never feel like it was not natural, you know? Yeah. Many people say, yeah, you're studying. Actually, when I graduated, I was not telling people that I was a mechanical engineer. I was just a, a housewife because they looked mm. me like earth, like an, a weird person. So when I was in a social meeting, mm -hmm. I, I, I was not all the time telling that I was a mechanical engineer. I just say, I'm a housewife, you know? <laughs> but, but, right, but right now, Fabiola, you must, be, you must be part of a very, very small group of women who have such an incredible sort of position, an incredible job that is so critical to astronomical research. I, I, you must be able to count, you know, your other sisters who do this kind of work in astronomy, you must be able to count them on one hand. Yeah, but it is what it is. And as I'm telling you, when I talk to, to you that people that is not in the day to day, then you realize, oh, Shit, look where I am, <laughs> you know. But the day to day is just fun. I I like to to do what I do, and the team is very. We have a, like a little family there in Alma. <laughs> very. Oh, family. that's really that's yeah. really nice, yeah. and that's really important that you that you have a really yes. nice work environment like that. That's great. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, so in uh in the work that you do. Uh, do you have an opportunity to talk to girls at all, young girls that are coming, uh, coming up in school about uh, opportunities uh, in the astronomy field or in mechanical engineering in unusual uh, sort of occupations? Uh, there, there's a fun, actually, there's the Alma does a lot of um, uh, initiative of things. Uh, Paulina Bocas, you have a foundation here in Chile that is called Provoca, and mm -hmm. then from to time yes she invited me to to give talks to to university or to school to small girl just to tell them go ahead i mean we are not different we have to to break this uh, thinking that you cannot do it everybody can do it you just want to do it you just must want it and that's it yeah that's great yes you know don't get too serious just do it and enjoy Right, just do it. Enjoy. And I, and after 14 years, I really think, I really, I think you're enjoying your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know by now what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll say. Uh, Fabiola, we do have some questions from our audience. If you don't mind, uh, we have a couple of questions if you're willing to take a couple of questions. Okay, let's see. Mike would like to know, how does she decide what area of space to look at and how much time does it take to adjust to an object? Ah, right. So Fabiola, the question is, from Mike. Uh, Mike, uh, for, this question is from Mike, and he wonders, how long does it take to uh, aim the telescope at an object? And how do, you, how do you choose which object you're going to observe? OK. It, it is not me. It's, Alma is have a, a, a lot a different uh, people in, in Europe. Europe in United States, and we receive uh, 2,000 uh, project, and then it is pick every project what is it is more interesting, and then um, every project have to have a certain configuration. So let's say we have 20 projects that need this this configuration, this type of array, another that need this type of array, and then we prepare this telescope for all these uh, winner. Let's call winner project. And then we, we do, as I'm telling you, we, we prepare like, like, let's say one month. And you have, you have to think that when you prepare the telescope, also the earth have to be in certain positions. So 
But let us, so the, the winner projects is going to, to study, I don't know, let's say the, the Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way or another galaxy somewhere. Okay, we have to have the Earth in that position, then we prepare this, the, the telescope. And then all the projects that could use that array will be, will be using that array. And then you have to think that we prepared the array. As I'm telling you, it takes us, a, let's say, two, three hours to move an antenna. It takes us a week to prepare an array. Mm -hmm. Once we have this array there ready, we are perfect. We are all set up. And then we could have bad weather. We could oh. have the cloud. So that winner project, the, the, we have a, a room with the operators and the astronomer. Alma have a team of astronomers astronomer, a team of operator, and then they say, okay, we have the array ready. We, are we, we, we observe 24 hours. It's not like the optical. We obs mm -hmm. observe 24 hours. So the, the light doesn't bother us. Mm -hmm. So they say, okay, we, we can use this antenna. We have this configuration. Less this project is interesting. And, and they, 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 they observe. And they can observe different things. Or is the weather is not for that frequency, if we have a cloud and it's not perfect, they use another frequency and they observe another project. So there are different factors. It's just not that they don't say just, okay, tonight we will see this. It's, it's uh, been prepared a year in advance. A year in advance, we prepare the array and then it's ready to go. And in that moment when, when the array is ready for all this type of project, they say, okay, let's observe. We have all the condition and they do it. And if they cannot do that one, they do another one. And then we move the array and we 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 observe another group of projects, let's say. That's how it works. That's very cool. Uh, I I I don't think I don't think many people in our in our audience have ever had an explanation like that before of how a very sophisticated observatory works. That was really great. Let's see if we have another question. Sandy would like to know, from her telescopes, are there any live sites that are being telecast that we can see? Oh, uh, Fabiola, who was it again, hon? Sandy. Oh, Sandy is asking us, um, when, they, when, the, when, when the OMA instrument is, is operating, are there any live, uh, streams available from uh, the ALMA website, for example, that, uh, you know, a, a someone outside could could watch or see the telescope in operation or something? Mm, um, as, as an external, you will just see the telescope moving because the data have to be collected and processed. So it's not like an optical that you see the sun and you see the moon. Here you receive waves and you have to process the image. And the information is uh, uh, for this winner project that I was telling you, they have an owner. So if I win a project, I get the observation and the data is for me for one year. After one year, all the data is public. So you can go to the ALMA page or, and then you can download all the information, actually Alma, Alma have so much information that we are not able to process it. There are many centers around the world trying to process all this data and whoever want to process this data after one year of this specific owner, it can, he, he, she can do it. Sandy can do it. If she wanted to have the mm -hmm. Alma data, it's public, it's public. Mm -hmm. But, but, uh, but it's a uh, wave, you have, to, you have to process the data. Right. Yeah. So that can that, that can often take some time, and of course the you know the 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 winner who gets the opportunity to use the telescope to collect the data uh, would also then process that data so that they might be able to publish you know uh, you know their research out of it before it gets released to the public. Okay. Yes. All right. Great. Thank yes. you. Okay. Great. Well, um, Fabiola, this has really been wonderful. I want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your really busy schedule to chat with us tonight. I'm sure what you shared with us has opened so many people's eyes and minds about how a sophisticated instrument works, but also helps us to understand uh, the great job that you have and the importance of the work that you do. And, uh, you know, we're all no. we're all really impressed and so pleased to have a chance to chat with you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for inviting me. And I just want to say to your audience to go ahead 
and study astronomy, study engineering. There are a lot of a lot of works to be done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fabiola. And I really hope that some of the younger members listening in our audience tonight will take some inspiration from from you and the work that you do. And hopefully there'll be hopefully there'll be a number of little girls who say, "I want to do what Fabiola does." I can I can tell you right now, Fabiola, I want to do what you do. <laughs> I'm hoping for you. I'm waiting for you here in Latin America. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. And Thanks good to luck you. with all your work. Thanks. So long. So long. Ciao. Bye. Folks, that was Fabiola Cruzat, who is an engineer at the Alma Radio Telescope Facility. She leads the maintenance team that takes care of 66 radio dishes that can be spread across 16 kilometers at 16,000 foot altitude in a really you know, difficult environment to work in. And she runs this team that makes sure that these instruments are working, set up and working properly so that astronomers from around the world can come collect data about the universe and help us better understand how this universe operates. So in many ways, I'd say that uh, Fabiola is a really critical piece of how we, under how we come to understand the universe because she makes the instruments work. Absolutely fantastic. I think it's really great. And I want to say thanks again to Fabiola for allowing us to be part of this. Uh, shout outs to her. Hey, we have, a, we have a whole bunch of shout outs to you, Fabiola. If you're still listening, I don't know, but uh, we're hearing from a lot of people that really enjoyed having you on. So uh, thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Everybody loved it. Fabiola was great. <laughs> okay, folks. Uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to, hopefully we'll talk to her again sometime. That would really be great, wouldn't it? Okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm glad we had this unique opportunity, such a unique opportunity to learn about such a fantastic instrument and such a great person operating. Okay, folks, so uh, armed with that information, you know what, uh, how astronomers are looking at the night sky. Let's give you some more information so you can join that group of astronomers looking at the night sky. Maybe not such sophisticated equipment, but nonetheless, uh, you'll be able to uh, do your own data gathering of the universe using your own data gatherers. So uh, let's jump in and talk a little bit about uh, what's available in the night sky. We'll come back and we'll finish up with some questions. Uh, so uh, let's just jump into what's available to be seen in the night sky right now. So folks, you know, I mentioned earlier that this is a great month for looking at the sky. And it's a great month for looking at the sky for a couple of reasons. First of all, there are a number of great planets that are available in the evening sky. And you know what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to bring up my uh, Stellarium Web Online app that I use. And you've seen this uh, a number of times. And uh, let me just let me just uh, get in and share my screen first, so you can see where I am here. I don't want you to look at me so much as I want you to see my screen here. And here we go. I'm going to do the screen share, and I'm going to bring up. And hopefully, you can see my Stellarium web uh, up now that shows you the night sky. And uh, this is the sky as it would appear tonight at 9:25 p.m. And right now on your screen, what you're seeing is looking in the direction north. Uh, you can see my cursor right down here circling the direction north. Uh, N, of course, is the indicator. And you'll see the other indicators, E for east over on the right-hand side, W for west over on the left-hand side. And uh, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to click and pull and just drag my cursor along until I have the direction west. Oh, 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 let me not get out of control here, folks. I got a little something going on here. Just a moment. I have to be careful about clicking and dragging too fast. But here we are. Okay, now, now I have things set up for us. I've set the sky as I would ask you to go out and observe, and that is facing the direction south. This places the direction west on your right. It places the direction east on your left. As you stand facing south with east on your left and west on your right, you're in the correct position for how the sky appears to pass overhead as you observe during the course of the evening. Objects will rise in the east, pass overhead through the south, and set over on the western side. So this is an ideal way for you to begin observing the night sky because it gives you a comfortable orientation. Now, if we start over on the western side of the sky, 
If you look over to the west at this time of evening, if you have a clear view of the western horizon, or I should say just after sunset, you'll see Venus gleaming brilliantly over on the western side. It appears as a bright white dot that isn't moving. You might at first mistake it for an airplane headlight, but you'll notice after a few minutes that it doesn't move. That's the planet Venus. It's bright, white in color, and has no twinkle. That's the other thing that will distinguish it as a planet. It has no twinkle. Okay, so that's over on the western side of the sky, just after sunset, and you can watch it sinking in the west as sunset progresses. Now, of course, the motion you're actually seeing of it sinking in the west is the Earth rotating on its axis from west to east. This provides what we call the apparent motion. Apparently, it seems as if the sky is moving by from east to west, when actually it's the Earth rotating from west to east. As this rotation progresses over on the eastern side of the sky, if you take a look at the map, you'll now see down in the southeastern portion of the sky, the two largest planets of our solar system, Saturn and Jupiter. Saturn leads the pair heading toward the south, and Jupiter follows not far behind. Obviously, Jupiter appears larger than Saturn does. Jupiter, of course, is much closer to Earth by a half billion miles almost, so naturally it would appear larger. Saturn and Jupiter are approximately the same size, but that distance makes Jupiter appear quite a bit larger. That makes it easier to identify. Again, it gleams over on the horizon there, or just above the horizon after sunset. And as we move further into the night, it will move higher into the sky. Jupiter has a creamy color, while Saturn has a slightly yellowish color. And you can tell the difference if you're observing under clear skies. These three planets, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn, are all visible in urban areas. So if you live in a city anywhere across the globe, you'll be able to see these objects, even though you may not be able to see some of the dimmer stars. You can still see these three planets and you can track their motion through the rest of the year. If you go out to observe every two or three nights, you'll be able to recognize how their position changes and when you see them during the course of the evening as the Earth makes its way around the sun. Now, halfway between these planets, Venus on the west, Jupiter and Saturn over on the eastern side, the Milky Way comes up from the southern horizon and stretches up toward the northeastern sky. What's really cool about this is this gives us a way to identify where to find five bright constellations of this season for this year. Let's start down at the southern horizon because that's an easier point for us to begin from. And there we have two bright constellations that sit astride the Milky Way. On the right side of the Milky Way, just above the letter S, there's an S-shaped curve of stars. And if you follow my cursor, you can see where this is. It starts right up here at these three stars in a row, swings down through this large bright star, comes down to the southern horizon, and swings back around in sort of a hook fashion. In a way, you could describe this as an S-shape. And this S-shape outlines the body of Scorpius the Scorpia. This is the scorpion of the night sky. We all knew there was a scorpion out there, but here's that body shape outlined in these bright stars making this S. Right at the heart of the scorpion is this reddish star called Antares, Antares, that reddish star right there. And if we come down to the tail of the scorpion here, right on the tip is another bright star called Shaula. Shaula is the bright star that marks the stinger on the tail of the scorpion. So that curve of bright stars right there is just to the right of the Milky Way and marks that Scorpion Scorpius. On the left side of the Milky Way, there's a smaller constellation that's actually in the shape of a teapot. A teapot, believe it or not. I say that because it has a top, a handle, a spout, and a body. So if you follow my cursor, I'll start at the top star at the top. One, two, three stars mark the top. One, two, three stars mark the spout. Let's do the body. One, two, three, four stars across here mark the body. And finally, the handle right here, this curve marks the handle of the teapot. I hope you can see the shape as I'm describing. Now, I'm describing shapes that are really, really familiar to us. But if we actually look at what the constellation shape is, let me show you what it actually looks like. 
Here's what it looks like. And now you can see a group of them up. You can see Scorpius really easily. And you're saying to yourself, how come he didn't show that to us at the beginning instead of going through all that drawing stuff? Well, there's Scorpius. Oh, did you see this right here? And then there's Sagittarius right here. Sagittarius is the teapot constellation. That's Sagittarius right there where the pot is. And you can see there are other stars connected off of the teapot, but you get the idea where the teapot is. It's right in that space that goes from the G of Sagittarius through to the R of Sagittarius. Right in there is the teapot. But if we look at the artwork that goes along with these, we have a very, very different story for these. And we don't have time to tell the story. And I recommend that you look the stories up yourself because they are really gripping in many instances. But if you take a look at Sagittarius, that's the most interesting one. Sagittarius is actually an archer, person with a bow and arrow. That's also a half man, half horse. Yes, it's a centaur with a bow and arrow. Well, the story is amazing. You should look it up. It's a great one, Sagittarius. Check it out. You'll find it quite interesting. Now that we've established where the Milky Way is, we're going to use the Milky Way to find our way along to the next group of stars and constellations. We're going to come up from the south, right along this soft glow of light that marks the billions of stars that are part of the Milky Way galaxy. This soft stretch of light marks the arms of our galaxy. And we're going to come to the three brightest stars we find in the summer sky up near the top of the sky. I'll point them out to you. There's Vega right here at the top of the sky that you can see. We'll go across to the northeast from Vega and come right up here to a star called Deneb, D-E-N-E-B. And then we'll come down here to a star called Altair. There's Altair right there. And these three stars together mark what's called the Summer Triangle. And if you look just adjacent to Altair, oh my goodness, look right there. There's a little satellite. See that little thing moving by right there? Now in this program, let's see, I'm gonna click on it and see if we can identify what it is. Oh yeah, how about that? Here's an interesting feature of this program. You can use it to identify satellites. And what you see here is a Starlink satellite. A Starlink satellite is one of those satellites that's part of this communication system that's being put into orbit by the SpaceX Corporation to provide high quality, low cost, worldwide accessible internet access for people everywhere around the world. The only issue with the Starlink satellites is that there are gonna be tens of thousands of them orbiting around in the night sky and they are visible. Astronomers are really concerned that it's gonna hamper their ability to image the night sky without having a Starlink satellite appear in the image. But I digress, we can look that up later. In any case, these three stars mark the spot of three main constellations of the evening sky. And those three constellations of the evening sky right here at Vega is the constellation Lyra. Up here at Deneb is the constellation Cygnus. And down here at Altair is the constellation Aquila. Lyra is a harp. Cygnus is a swan flying along the Milky Way toward the south. And you can see the wings of the swan right here. Here's the neck, the bill of the swan here, the tail of the swan at Deneb. And Altair is the, I'm sorry, Altair marks the brightest star of Aquila the eagle. Here are the wings of the eagle. Here's the beak of the eagle here, the tail of the eagle here flying in the opposite direction. If we take a look at the artwork, it looks like this. Here's the eagle right here, right up in here. You can see Cygnus, there's Vega, and right in here, Volpecula in the middle between the two. Doesn't show up very well because it's not so bright. But these three constellations mark this summer triangle. Even under bright sky conditions in center city environment, you can see these three stars marking the summer triangle. And in that way, you can identify these three constellations. So now you've been able to find five of the brightest constellations of the summer sky using this map and identifying the bright stars. You'll also be able to identify the location of the Milky Way. So we've talked about the planet Venus. We've talked about Jupiter and Saturn. We've identified these five constellations, Scorpius, Sagittarius, Lyra, uh, Altair and Deneb, uh, I'm sorry, Altair and uh, Cygnus the Swan, yes, that's right, uh, along the Milky Way that you can use to help find your way around the night sky. Now, if you really want to get into understanding or learning all of these constellations, it's not really that hard. You just start with one or two, and then you learn to identify the constellation that's adjacent to the one you've learned already, and you have another one. 
Here's a really cool example I like of this. We'll do it really quickly. Down here at Scorpius, down here at Scorpius, I'm gonna remove the artwork for a second. Down here at Scorpius, here are the three stars that mark the head of the Scorpion. Well, stars that come uh, around the head and up to here, around the head and out to here. These three stars along here, one, two, three. Those three stars mark the next constellation along. They are now the stars of the constellation Libra, the scales. Now those stars actually used to belong to the constellation Scorpius, but they no longer do. The claws of the scorpion have been pulled back so that those three stars can be assigned to the constellation Libra. So now, if you just look ahead or forward in the direction that the scorpion is looking, these three stars, you can now identify where Libra is without too much difficulty at all. See, very simple, easy for you to do. Now you don't go out and do this all at once in one night. Nope, you do it on successive evenings for short periods of time, say 10 minutes or 15 minutes each evening, every other evening or every three evenings. And in a couple of weeks, you will have identified all of these constellations of the night sky without much difficulty at all. And of course, this particular application works well for this, so you can use that too. Okay, other things that we can see in the evening sky right now that are really important for you to know about this month, the Perseid meteor shower. Yes, the best meteor shower available to be seen during the summer months. Now, there's another meteor shower in December called the Geminid meteor shower that might have more meteors per hour. And here's the catch. It's winter, December 14th. Here we are, August, the 12th to the 14th, as the perfect time to observe. The weather's nice and warm. It's a good time to be out. You might be on vacation. You and a group of friends can go out and take a look at the night sky from the 12th to the 14th to see if you can catch some of these meteors. Now, the Perseid meteors appear as bright streaks that zip across the sky. The best time to see them, the best time, is between midnight and sunrise. In that way, the Earth is rotating into the stream of meteors, but if you can't hang up that late, that's okay. As soon as the sky becomes dark, you can start looking for Perseid meteors. Now, these seem to come from a portion of the sky, the constellation Perseus, that's rising in the northeastern portion of the sky at around 11 p.m. But before 11 p.m., as the sky darkens, you'll still be able to see Perseid meteors. Or I should say you'll already be able to see Perseid meteors. If the sky is dark at nine o'clock, you can catch some then even as well. Now, these meteors that we're talking about, the bright streaks they make, you might think that they're pretty big. And if you see a really big one, it's gonna land someplace. Well, that's not very likely. And the reason why is because the meteors are actually the size of sand grains. They're not very big. They're only sand grain size, but it's their incredible velocity, their high speed that creates the bright streak as they punch into the Earth's atmosphere that causes the air around that little tiny grain of sand to glow and create the bright streak that you see. Now, as it plunges into the Earth's atmosphere, the density of the atmosphere is going to slow that piece of meteor dust down and cause it to fall to the Earth. And the Earth collects hundreds of tons of meteor dust every year. But it's rare that we actually see something that reaches the surface of the Earth. When these objects are out in space, if they don't come into the Earth's atmosphere, they're called meteoroids. If they enter the Earth's atmosphere, we call them meteors. If they strike the surface, that's when we call them meteorites. So it's rare that we see a lot of meteorites striking the Earth these days, although there are plenty of them. I say it in a relative sense because much earlier in the Earth's history, oh, there were millions of meteors striking the Earth all the time, and big ones too. But since the early history of the solar system, a lot of them have been swept up. Now, that particular, uh, that particular meteor shower, the Perseid meteor shower, is the result of a comet that has passed through this portion of the solar system. And as the nucleus has melted, the dust and detritus left over from this comet has spread along an orbital path that the Earth passes through every year at about this time. So right around August 12th, every year, the Earth reaches the densest portion of this stream of meteors. 
So now this year, we're in great luck because from the 12th to the 14th, it's a perfect time for us to see the peak of the meteor shower. And as it turns out, on the 12th, the moon is only four days old, having been new on the 8th of August this coming Sunday. So that means the moon sets early enough that we have dark sky the rest of the night to observe the Perseid New Year shower. So what's my recommendation for you? Find some place where the sky is clear and dark. Go out with a group of friends, take a radio, take some music, take a picnic basket, go out and enjoy the night sky. And oh, by the way, you can look for some meteors at the same time. But I've left out one of the most important things about it. How many meteors will you see? This, my friends, is a meteor shower. You'll see up to 120 meteors per hour. 120 meteors per hour. How does that count relative just to regular night? Well, on any clear night, you can see 10 meteors per hour. Any clear night, you can see 10 meteors. So 120 is pretty good. So just the same, I say, make it a party. Go outside, have a good time under the night sky and see if you can catch some of these meteors. It's a great chance to do so. Technically speaking, the shower begins at the end of July and lasts until the end of August. But the peak of activity is right there from the 12th to the 14th. That's the best time to go out and observe. Okay, so make sure you go out and do that. Okay, folks, we talked about those summer constellations. We talked about the planets that are available. We talked about the Perseid meteor shower. We have just a few minutes left in our program so we can take some of your questions. Let's see if we can get some of those questions taken care of for you here now. What do you have for us, Linda? There have been several news stories in recent months about UFOs witnessed by first hand military personnel as well as reliable sensor systems. What are your thoughts? Haha. <laughs> the question is, what are my thoughts about the recent reports that we've had coming in? about UFOs having been seen by reliable government sources and other reliable sensors. You know, there are so many phenomena that happen in the sky. It's completely, uh, you know, let me restart that. Here's my real feeling. My real feeling is that, yes, it is highly possible that there are objects that we have not been able to identify that fly in our atmosphere. Why? We just can't identify what they are. But that does not mean that they are alien spacecraft, that they are spacecraft that come from an alien civilization that has traveled over hundreds of millions, if not billions of miles, it's gotta be billions of miles, hundreds of billions of miles of space to come to this portion of this galaxy to visit this planet. Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible for that to happen. But extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. That's what the famous astronomer Carl Sagan said, and he's absolutely correct. Is it possible that they could be aliens? It's possible. Is it likely? No, it's not likely at all. Why not? Because the distances that any civilization would need to travel around this galaxy alone are incredibly enormous. In fact, most of us can't really comprehend how big these distances are. Now, if you think about that, what does that require? Well, it really requires that you have a spacecraft that can travel such distances. The inhabitants have to be able to survive such a trip and all sorts of other things like that that compound and really begin to define how difficult it is for long distance space travel to be done. So do I think that they are aliens coming here? No, I don't think that's very likely at all. I think that there are plenty of opportunities for things to be seen that we have not been able to identify, that doesn't mean they're wrong. Okay, all right, great, what's next? Anna would like to know how fast does a meteor travel? Oh, Anna, you'd like to know how fast meteors travel, 45,000 miles per hour. Zoom, how about that? Really, really fast. When you see it in the sky, Anna, it only takes one or two seconds. Really long lasting ones are four to five seconds. So typically, you'll see a streak in a second, maybe two seconds. Okay, what's next? Bill would like to know, why is Midsummer Eve on the solstice and not on August 1st? Oh, yeah. Hey, Bill, that's a really great question. Why is Midsummer Eve in uh, on the solstice and not in... August 1st? Not on August 1st. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, the, the reason why that is is because... Back in the old world, it was considered 
that summer began much earlier than actually pegged from the seasonal beginning of you know, June 21st to September 21st. If you look at it that way, when the Earth is reaching these points in its orbit around the sun, then midsummer arrives on August 1st. But if you're looking at it from an agricultural perspective, uh, it's different. It was actually considered that May 1st was the beginning of summer. And so that would place midsummer uh, in June rather than placing it way back in September. I understand what you mean by that. Uh, if you look at Shakespeare's play, oh gosh, I'm really going to show myself here by not being able to think about it. Um, a Midsummer's Night Dream. Thank you very much for my studio producer here to help me with that. A Midsummer's Night Dream. That takes place in June. It doesn't take place in August. And that's the reason why. Thanks, Bill. Great question. Okay, folks, uh, uh, that's it for questions tonight that we can take right now. We've come to the end of our program. If you have more questions, please send them and I'll be happy to answer them. I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening. We had a great time talking uh, with Fabiola. Uh, from the uh, Alma Observatory in Chile. And we've had a chance to talk about all this other really great stuff. I hope you get outside to observe the night sky this summer. It's a perfect opportunity to do so. The Perseid meteor shower is this month and uh, we won't have this next month. So please get out and take a look at that. Uh, make yourselves uh, astronomers by getting out to look at the night sky, connect with the night sky. It's a good way to relieve stress Take a little breather from everything that's happening in the world today and just reconnect with the universe. We all want to connect with the universe in one way or another, to some degree or another. Take some time to do that. It'll help you feel better. So, uh, you know, the Franklin Institute is open these days and we'd love to have you come visit us. We, are, we have gone back to asking all of our visitors to wear masks in the building. Whether you've been fully vaccinated or not, we still need you to wear a mask. So please do that and come visit us. We have all these great exhibits that we want you to see. Uh, not only do we have our fabulous creativity exhibit that's at the Franklin Institute that, uh, that has been held over for a while. We also have a, this really cool pop-up exhibit called Jellyfish Reveal featuring live jellyfish. It's a really fantastic exhibit, really cool to see. And of course it features my favorite kind of jellyfish. What type would they be? You know moon jellyfish get it right moon jellyfish keep your day job you said yeah okay great thanks a lot okay all right forget that well in any case the other thing that you need to know is coming up next year early in 2022 harry potter the exhibition we're going to have this really fantastic harry potter exhibit that's coming in early 2022. You'll find more information at the Franklin Institute's website, along with lots of other really cool information of all kinds about science, even links back to programs like this, all at the Franklin Institute's website. Go out there and check it out and then come down and visit us. We'd love to have you uh, come see us. You can also check out other Franklin Institute home programs on, uh, at fi.edu as well. And don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter at Cool Astronomer. I give updates on stuff that's happening in the night sky, and I also give updates on what's happening with the next space race. We have a lot to talk about with that, and next month we're going to concentrate on that because we've had a whole summer of really cool space activities happening, and there's another big one coming up in September that I have a really close connection to. So you don't want to miss that. We'll talk about the big space race, the next space race that's happening right now. We'll talk about that next month. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight. We hope you had a great time. Uh, come back and catch us again next month when we'll present the September 2021st edition of Night Skies at the Observatory. Thanks for joining us, folks. We're here at Night Skies at Home, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Have a great August. So long. Enjoy the Perseid Meteor Shower. Wow, Fabiola was great. She had such great information and it was really